Jordan Peterson, how are you, brother? Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I've been hearing your voice in my own head for the last 12 hours I've been reading your book, which is a beautiful thing when you start to understand someone and understand their cadence and the actual writing itself is written in someone's voice. So as I'm going through and you're speaking, I can hear you speaking it. And I think that's a, a testament to a work that's really well written is that it carries not only the information that you have to offer, but that intangible essence of, of your personality and who you are, which is part of the artistry and part of the magic. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've got a copy of the book and that, that you've been able to stay in it for 12 hours. It's hard for me to evaluate the book, you know. Um, I tried to make it of a quality equivalent to the last book, whatever quality that was. But after working on the material for so long, it's virtually impossible to even see what about it is original. It, it, you get blind to it. So I'm watching the public reviews right now. They're starting to roll in. And so far, you know, I get the odd one-star review from either someone who's got a damaged book on Amazon and is angry about it or, uh, uh, or someone who really doesn't like me at all. And, you sure. know, wants to use an early review as a way of making that crystal clear. But yeah. generally speaking, people seem to consider it the equal of the previous book. And, and so that's, that's about as good as I can do. So that's good enough, I guess. No doubt. No doubt. It's all we can do. The difference, you know, in the time that this book is published versus the time that your last book is published, always things evolve and culture and society, everything evolves. But this has been probably the most dramatic period in the macro that we've seen. And it seems like a lot of the things that you've been talking about for years have actually been exacerbated during the, the external challenges that we faced, or maybe just the fruition of some of these seeds that had already been planted ways in which people are using moral superiority, ways that they're creating dominance hierarchies and everything from diet to political ideologies to health ideologies to any kind of identity ideology that they have, creating these dominance hierarchies and then really supporting these in any way possible by whatever means necessary. And if that means you know, going after somebody by whatever ruthless means, by whatever fallacious logic is necessary, it seems like it's more justified and justifiable in people's minds now than ever. Is that what you feel when you look out in the world and see that? Well, I'm always, I, yes, I would say I do see that. But then I also wonder about being skeptical about that. And for, for a variety of reasons, I mean, one possibility is that I'm much more likely to receive information of that type that's in keeping with what I thought was going to happen because people send it to me and I get exposed to it. And um, it's increasingly easy in some sense to be a prisoner of your own interests online because the online world shape, shapes itself around your interests. And you participate in that by following certain people and not other people. And um, so it's, it's difficult to get an unbiased estimate of what's actually going on. And then also, you know, I think the world is more critical, like people are being criticized more intently because we can communicate better and better. And so it's really easy for five random people to send off pot shots, say, on Twitter mm -hmm. with respect to a particular celebrity or to put up a blog post. Like Matthew McConaughey came on my blog or my podcast, my YouTube uh, channel and podcast about a month ago, month and a half ago, maybe two months ago. Um, and there were articles popping up here and there about him flirting with the alt-right and how despicable that was. But it's very difficult to evaluate any of that because the blogs weren't, I have no idea what their readership is, for example. I don't have any idea about their sphere of influence. And the other thing that's strange too is that the net equalizes people in a strange way so that um, in many circumstances, especially with regards to social media, someone with 7 million followers will get the same prominence in a Google search, for example, as someone with 150 or 200. And so, so yes, um, 
I think I see the continued operation of many of the things that were starting to perturb me, well, 30 years ago, but more particularly five years ago. But I am always somewhat skeptical about the information I receive. I also think that's become universally true for people, you know, I mean, we, we're not, we, we have no idea who to rely on for a reliable narrative. Mm. And that's also a problem because you can find information that it appears to demonstrate virtually any old thing. And it's very hard to evaluate it. I mean, that's what journalists in principle should have used to do, I would say. Yeah. When, when they were good journalists, they were the filters. And to the degree that they were credible and ethical and skilled, they helped us dispense with information that wasn't, at least in principle, worthy of our attention. And now, it seems like there's less of that. I, I, don't, I don't have any pleasure, I don't take any pleasure in seeing these cultural institutions perish. You know, the New York Times seems shaky to me, ethically <laughs> and probably financially. Um, the London Times is exactly the same. The major TV networks, it's the same. They can't compete with YouTube. They're dead in the water, absolutely. You, you broadcast TV can't compete with YouTube, not a chance. And radio doesn't seem to be able to compete with podcasts. But then we lack that... We lack some universal, we, we lack sources of universal narratives, and that seems to be fragmenting us. And I think it's exaggerating the voice of people who are hypercritical. So, the, what, what comes out of the absence of that, though, is really exactly how you answered this question, which was actually even questioning your own bias. So, it is a return to your own faculties of logic and ration and reason and your own understanding of your own short sightedness and blindness, a thing of which we cannot ever escape. We will always be partially blind. And so, to recognize that, we have to think and we have to think about all of these things, we have to look at all of the information and actually come to our own conclusions based upon this instead of the you know blind reliance on some other credible authority we have to yeah, look at but all the authorities it's hard it's hard yeah right? sure because, you know because partly what you want you want a social surround that provides you with a sample of information that's unbiased and so there is a filter there because of course you can't attend to everything but you hope that you attend to pieces of everything somewhat randomly so that you get a, a, a low resolution picture of the whole. But increasingly, you can go down rabbit holes of one sort or another. And I've really seen a rise of what I would call paranoid slash conspiratorial thinking among virtually everyone I know, um, right or left, it doesn't really matter. You know, the, the left wingers are convinced that the right is engaged in a a neo-Nazi conspiracy that culminated in the coup attempt in December, and the right is convinced that the lefties are taking over the schools and 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 the and that they dominate the Democrat Democratic Party, for example, and um, and each of those, as you move towards the extremes of the political views, each of those uh, what well, communities have their own. well, their own paranoid spin on the world. And so it's very difficult, it's very difficult to make sense of it. And mm. I think people are missing the, all, a lot of these conspiratorial ideas are missing, a, a, you know, they're missing the understanding of Hanlon's razor to not ascribe malice that which can be ascribed to incompetence and just some other simple bias, some other simple explanation, because we see all of this out that's happening and we can sense like a violin that's out of tune, even if you're not a great musician, you can tell when an instrument is out of tune. We can tell when truth is out of tune and we see it everywhere. But instead of saying, oh, well, these are just flawed instruments for whatever reason, their own bias or their own incompetence, their lack of efficacy in their, in their craft. But instead, we're assuming that they're all linked up together and communicating on some secret platform with robes and having secret meetings and trying to figure this out. I think largely what we're seeing is we just can tell that a lot of things aren't coming to us true. And so we're trying to make a story out of it, which is the hu well, basic we function of the humans. To, we also try to make a personality out of it. Yeah. You know, and so that if you read a, a magazine like The Economist, for example, which I think is still a pretty reliable magazine, 
when the economist talks about countries, Mexico, it personifies Mexico and Mexico is doing such and such. And so there's an instant description of a personality as a kind of shorthand and everyone understands what that means. But we also tend to take all sorts of bits of information about what the conservatives are doing or what the liberals are doing. And then we turn that into a personality in, in, in a sense that's got a brain that's planning all of this. And of course, some of that is true, but but it's not easy to figure out how much of it is true and it's easy for it to go too far. And I do think, I do think a tremendous amount of it is a consequence of, of our inability to keep up with the new technologies of communication. Mm-hmm. They're, they're unbelievably powerful, but they seem, they seem, to, but they're peculiar and we don't understand how they work. We don't understand how to protect ourselves against them. We don't even understand what they're doing to us. Twitter, I think is, a, is really the best example of that um, because to, w- with YouTube, or the longer form uh, conversations, there's more meat there, you know, you can't be led astray as quickly, I don't think, but, and you know, you're not, you're not hitting 200 long form videos a day if you're on YouTube, but you can easily be hit by two or 300 tweets a day if you're on Twitter. And what that all amounts to, it's very addictive, it's very interesting, um, but what it amounts to in terms of valid information is not easy to say. So I wouldn't say that, I don't know what's going on. I haven't got a, I feel it, I feel a drift, I would say, in terms of my ability to interpret what's happening. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about this. Like, Well, there's certain things, and I think we also have a bias to what we're afraid of, depending on our own proclivities, but depending on our own nature, whether we tend towards conservatism in order, or whether we tend toward the creative impulse, impulse of liberalism. And you talk about this in your book we'll have a bias towards looking at those things that we're afraid of and we'll see something and, and also, you know, kind of our general understanding. So for the most part, I'm like you curious, navigating, looking at things that aren't true, standing up when I see something that doesn't feel right, being comfortable receiving the arrows that you get for standing up against the consensus narrative, which becomes that tyranny of the majority that tries to keep everything in line and we have to be willing to do that to our own extent to stand up for what we believe is true. But then there's certain things that I find are particularly scary for me. Okay. And that's so the particularly scary thing was what was coming out of uh, the Davos Forum, the World Economic Forum, when they started putting out things. And this was actually an article that was published a while ago in 2016 on Forbes. And it was published by the World Economic Forum, where they said, Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better by the World Economic Forum. So this is an an ideology that they're putting out, that there's a new future, a new utopian future, which sounds very much like a dystopia to me, in which personal privacy, I mean, personal property has been abolished, privacy has been abolished, and somehow, magically, everything is better better. because of it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the part of that that's hard to swallow. It's like, first of all, Let's hope that that doesn't happen by 2030, because that's way, way, way too fast for anything good to happen. And then, you know, what's the chance that that particular direction is going to produce nothing but rapid positive outcomes? It's very r- Positive outcomes are very difficult to produce, and mm. rapid positive outcomes are even more difficult to produce. So, it, I mean, that's to the degree that I'm a conservative, and I don't think I'm particularly conservative by temperament because I'm high in openness, which is the creativity dimension, and it's the best predictor of liberalism. Um, I'm conservative because I don't believe that things can rapidly change for the better, um, especially if those who are driving the changes are driven by an ideology that ascribes to themselves some kind of moral superiority. That's very dangerous. Um, it sounds, I've heard that before, that, that, that bite from the World Economic Forum. It sounds like they had a really good publicity marketer sum up their meetings. You know, that's much more uh, vivid prose than I would have expected from yep. what's essentially an administrative organization you know, or, or an organization made up of administrators. So, but they then, did, you know, they did I, hire a marketing team. I, from my understanding, they hired a marketing team. Well, that's exactly what it sounds like, you know, yeah. and, and, and so... Uh, and I have some sympathy for that because what the hell good are ideas unless you can get them out where people look at them. Sure. You know, I don't think it's a good idea to be 
um, what would you call, contemptuous of sales and marketing efforts. I think that's a big mistake for anybody that wants to aim at success, particularly with regards to their own creative endeavors, but to success in general. But um, that doesn't mean there aren't pathologies of marketing and, and hype is certainly one of them. I mean, that's, exaggera- that's exaggerated claims. That's a form of untruth for rhetorical purposes. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I've been involved in, huh, I've been criticized, interestingly enough, for working with the UN, and I worked on a UN subcommittee for a while. I wasn't paid to do the work, by the way. Um, it wasn't a formal job. It was something I was doing while I was a professor, and I was doing it with a colleague and friend of mine. And uh, it was, we were working on a, a, a sustainability report for the UN Secretary General. And I got a chance to see how those things worked. So this is a perfect place to think about a conspiracy because it was a, a, an international document. It was compiled by teams from all over the world. And it set the course for a vision for development, economic development and environmental development over the next 50 years, something like that. But it was so interesting to watch how it worked. So putatively, it was many heads of state who made up the committee that formulated this report. But they were titular figureheads. And the reason for that was that all those heads of state, former or present, were way too busy to sit down and write a report. And so what happened was the obligation for writing the report fell down the administrative hierarchy until someone had some time, like me at that time in the interest, to say, okay, I'll do that. And then what happened was that, well, who determined the direction of the document? And the answer to that was, well, whoever was, to do, was willing to do the work of writing it. Because all the people that were involved had full-time jobs doing something else. And no one that was on the committee was competent in some sense to generate a plan for economic development sustainability over the next 50 years because that's beyond anyone's capacity. And so what happened was a a draft would be written by someone who took the time to write it, and then it would either be accepted or not accepted. But the criteria by whether or not it would be accepted was whether or not someone else would rewrite it. And if the answer to that was no, then it stood the way it was. It wasn't like there was no conspiracy. And I, I read the first documents and they were really, I didn't like them at all. They, were, they sounded like to me like they'd been written in 1985. It was sort of boilerplate UN, North versus South, capitalist versus socialist rhetoric that was 40 years out of date and dull. And so what I did to the degree that I could was get rid of that. And no one really objected to that because it was sort of filler to begin with. It was mm. inertial filler. And so... It wasn't, a con- and I would also say certainly the people that I was involved with um, had motives that were as trustworthy as the motives of any reasonably ethical group of people that you would get together to do something like this. They were hoping to produce a document that would help economic growth and help sustainable economic growth. Now, whether or not they did that, who, who knows? I don't really know what impact the report had. Um, some, you know, some. But there was no conspiracy. Jesus, there wasn't enough central intelligence associated with the process to produce a conspiracy. Right. And, and it's, it's a funny thing because you despise your enemies in some sense, but you're... you're the, your theoretical enemies, but you're willing to ascribe to them organizational power that's really beyond, it's beyond yours, it's, it's beyond your teams. So, having said that, ideologies tend to work as conspiracies. So, you know, there is something to, yeah, there is something to be said about that. It's you know, encur- I, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, no, please do. Please go ahead. It's, it's encouraging, though, to actually look at it like this and to hear your accounting because I think we do. We get kind of spun up and overwrought with our stories, and we will create this Star Wars kind of narrative where a great evil is amassing the Fellowship of the Ring, Sauron and Saruman mm-hmm. are aligning, and we are the we are the few. We as humans, we like that story, and I think that's 
the root for a lot of this. But then when you actually look behind the curtain, it's all Wizard of Oz. I've never, so- look, I've never seen that. And I've, I've been, I've seen how power operates in, at high levels, in corporations, in politics, on the right and the left, um, on, in entrepreneurial circles. I've never seen anything like that operating anywhere, yeah. like an evil conspiracy. You know, and I've met all sorts of people about whom conspiratorial thinking had been generated, often reams of it. And I was almost, cons- almost constantly shocked at the disjunction between their reputation and the reality of their existence. You know, and I, I should have been less shocked than that because the, me- the media portrayal of, of me, at least, it's polarized because there, there are people in the mainstream media who've been consistent supporters of mine. I'd say it's probably 50-50 on the media front, Mm -hmm. but certainly the most vicious criticism of me has come from the mainstream media and and from the liberal intelligentsia, essentially. And if you took that as your guide to who I was, man, you wouldn't want me to be around, that's for sure. You wouldn't (laughs) want to have me around. I don't think it bears any resemblance to me, but you know, I'm and I, you might think, well, I'm bi- heavily biased in my favor, but I'm not. My depressive temperament pretty much precludes any intense bias in my favor, I think. Sure, sure. I think a lot of us share that in common where there's no criticism that could be lobbed at us that's more vicious than the criticism we've offered to ourselves in many of those quiet, self-deprecating moments that we all subject ourselves to. But also- yeah, Well, the- now and then I run across a particularly inspired piece of criticism from a journalist <laughs> and I think, no, that's, that's gone beyond even what I've hit myself <laughs> with. But, but, it, yeah. but, but it's certainly the case that, well, as I said, I've never run into that. You know, I, I've, I've been in planning sessions with people of all sorts where they're trying to exert uh, influence over policy in one way or another. But- not a, not a comprehensive conspiracy made up of powerful people who are directing things in a particular direction for nefarious schemes of their own. And I think you can actually see here, here's an example of how you can see this in the real world, I think. And I think that I'm, I'm stunned, for example, at how rapidly the capitalist overlords are kowtowing to the politically correct, especially at the corporate level. And it just stuns me because I think well, if, if the capitalists were the evil intelligence that the radical lefties suggest, they'd be much more resistant to going along with diversity, inclusivity, and equity uh, initiatives, for example, than they are, because they're inviting in a fifth column, and they're doing it to please a very, very small minority of people. But, cripe, they're just falling over themselves to do it. And, that, and how do you account for that? Part of the way you account for it is that there isn't an evil conspiracy working in the background that's even capable of defending itself against what is, by in all reality, not that intense a threat. Yeah. So I, th- I think perhaps one of the reasons that also psychologically people are imagining these vast conspiracies is it allows people to stand back and say, well, what am I going to do anyways? What can I, what could I do against these great odds that are amassed? And it, it almost gives permission for those sins of omission that you talk about, the, the lack of courage to stand up for what you believe around a certain idea. If things mm-hmm. are overwhelming, then what could you do anyways? And then you can just go on and have the excuse to not make a stand but if you start to pull all these apart and recognize their small ideas and little things that are happening like one of your clients that you that worked in the corporate environment that you talked about that you know it was something about flip charts and and how these charts flip charts and how this whole ideology was coming through and how she needed to make her own personal little stand in the way that she could for that but if you imagined a vast conspiracy you might just be overwhelmed and say ah screw it and I think, so I want to dive into that that's, more. That's a, that's a good, yeah, because you always have to ask yourself, you know, to what degree are you using your theory to evade moral culpability or responsibility? And you have to think that you're probably doing that because it's very attractive to do that. That's, sure. you know, a psychoanalytic secondary gain. You've got to check yourself against, against your own, the, the, the high probability of your own faults. Um, but, you know, one of the things I noticed, for example, when I worked in the government, I worked for social services in Alberta as a consultant, province of Alberta, as a consultant 
years ago, 30 years ago, probably longer ago than that. And, you know, if, if the Department of Social Services got a letter from a constituent to the minister, that letter would be handed down from the minister to the deputy minister to the assistant deputy minister. It would fall down the administrative hierarchy, but not that far. And someone would answer it and take it seriously. And that was because the, the, the assumption was, the approximate assumption was one letter represented 10,000 opinions. Mm. Now, you know, if the letter was completely insane, well, that was a different story. But these things were they, these things were taken seriously, and people do have more power than they think, uh, assuming that they can muster up enough literacy to craft a letter, for example. And that might have been diluted in the, in the time of email, let's say, because it's too, too easy in some sense to fire off an email. But it's not like politicians aren't watching for, the, for response to their initiatives. Not all of them, and, but the ones that are successful... They, they actually care what their constituents think or they don't last very long. Right. So, so the systems are, and I know too from in political parties in Canada in particular, they're, they're hardly anyone participates in them. So what that means is that if you want to influence a political party and you set your mind to it, you can attain a position of some stature easily within a two-year period. And that, that would be relatively independent of your background in education. Now, not entirely, but commitment will do it because they're they're chronically starved for manpower so you know people are skeptical well what could i do it's like well have you have you joined a political party have you gone to a political to a constituents meeting like have you tried anything like that and that's also why you know and maybe this isn't so good why a small minority of people can have uh, an undue influence over over an entire over the movement of an entire culture Mm. We're not it, as weak as we think. <clears throat> that's and that's a really key message that you've been putting out, and that's I think why people, you know, you mention it in your book why a hush falls over the crowd when they're paying attention intently when you talk about personal responsibility and our sovereign power that we have. You you wrote a quote. You write about making a stand. Better to stand forward, awake when the costs are low, and perhaps when the potential rewards have not yet vanished. Better to stand forward before the ability to do so has been irretrievably compromised. And it's this rallying cry to like, okay, now there's these things, there's a whole gamut of information out there. People are contending with ideas. Sometimes a wave will flow one way and it's very intense. But if we all stand and just stand for what we believe in now, while things are still relatively undecided the landscape has not been determined this is the time this is the time to really stand up voice your opinion you might get a few dirt clods thrown at you that's okay you know that's just the nature of of life yeah well and you if you don't do that you don't get wiser and you don't you don't you don't get wiser and stronger, you get weaker. That, that's a big problem. Like mm -hmm. um, the client that you mentioned, um, going along with what she objected to on the, at the level of conscience would have, was, was weakening her. And I've seen that in a variety. In fact, part of the reason that I got so interested in political correctness, again, um, because I, I, I had seen it rise in the 1990s when I was teaching in Boston and it rose up and then it, the economy boomed like mad in the United States in the 1990s and it just went away for a while. And we thought, well, you know, it's gone, but then it came back with vengeance. And part of the reason I got so obsessed with it for a while was because I had like three clients, all whose political beliefs, by the way, ranged across a wide spectrum, all of who'd been bullied to the point of a breakdown in their workplace. You know, and, and they kept being asked to do things that violated their conscience. And, you know, partly they didn't exactly know how to, it's not, you should stand up, but it's not that easy. And it's not that easy to figure out when you should do it. But you should do it when, if, if you're going along with something that violates your conscience, then you lessen yourself. You're starting to pay a big price then. And so at some point, at some point you have to think, and this is something I walked through with my clients all the time when they were trying to make a decision. You know, everyone looks at the costs of making a decision, but almost no one looks at the costs of not making the decision. And the reason for that is like, well, you're sitting there right now and the sky isn't falling on you. 
And so you're not calculating the costs of sitting there because nothing's happening. And then if you decided to do something different, you might calculate the costs of doing that, but you've already zeroed out the costs of inertia. But they aren't zero, there's no zero cost. There's risk here and there's risk here. And, and you don't like that idea because you want security and no bloody wonder. It's no wonder you want security. But when you're making a decision, you need to reawaken the costs of inertia. I mean, those are, those are opportunity costs, let's say, something like that. There, there, are way, you know, there are ways they are formally considered, but just going along as you are when everything is changing around you is also a costly decision. And so if you know that, you think, well, there's danger here and there's danger here, then that, weirdly enough, that frees you up because then you can pick the danger that you prefer. Now, the, mm -hmm. the price you pay is the realization that there's no security down either road. And that's, you have to wake up to that now and then in your life. It's very unpleasant. It's not surprising people don't do it. But again, there, the, the costs of, of failing to do it are worse. I have so, a very visceral example of this. And, you know, one of the challenges for me internally, as everything has happened in 2020, is I didn't see people making a holistic discussion about the utilization of global resources that we were allocating to COVID. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have done what we did, but I, there was missing a discussion. You know, the U.S. alone created over $4 trillion of wealth, and that's an immense amount of wealth that could do an immense amount of good, global good. But the discussion wasn't, okay, we're able to create all of this wealth. We've just shown that we are. Is this the right course of action, or can we get you know, a forum together of people to talk about the best way to handle this from a completely global holistic perspective, supporting all populations equally and suss it out. Oh, I don't yeah, that, that, that virtually never happens. The only person yeah. I've ever seen do that is Bjorn Lomberg. So, and he has teams of economists. So one of the things that, that interested me when I was working on this UN panel was were the UN developmental goals. And each of those goals had emerged because every goal was an aim that had a constituency. So, you know, there were groups, political groups, national groups, economic groups, you name it, who had an interest of some sort, and they would make a goal out of that interest, and then that got incorporated into this list of 200 goals. And the problem with the list of 200 goals is that's too many goals. <laughs> and so you don't do anything because 200 you can't aim at 200 things. You can't make an organization that will do 200 things. You're lucky if you can make an organization that'll do one thing. And so then I, I objected to that in a variety of ways and learned that no one would prioritize because as soon as you elevate one goal over another, you offend the group whose goal has been subordinated. And so every, no one will touch it. And then what happens is you get the decision, decisions of the sort that you're describing, which are made in haste without taking the full context into account. And this happens everywhere. Like, look, here, here's something about managers that's interesting. Um, there's, a, there's an MBA program at McGill developed by a man who wrote a book called uh, Managers, Not MBAs, if I remember that correctly. It's been years since I thought about this, but he has this... MBA program where he takes, they have to be practicing managers to get into the MBA program. And one, and he takes them out of their normal day-to-day -day operations. And he has them do such things as writing about their goals. And when the managers themselves were asked to rate the utility of the MBA program, one of the things they pointed to was the time they took away from work because at work they're just putting out one fire after another there wasn't any time to step back and say okay here's five problems that are complex here's how we should sequence them and develop them into the future that always gets pushed aside and it gets pushed aside in people's own lives because they're dealing mm -hmm. with moment to moment crises so as an individual you have that problem you, you can't think about what you really want and plan for the future because you're so busy dealing with the chaos of the present. It happens in small businesses. It happens in large businesses. It happens in government. It happens everywhere. And you have to be able to step back and prioritize. Now, Lomberg hired teams of economists to evaluate the millennial goals on a cost-benefit basis, which 
you know, you could argue about whether or not that's the best basis upon which to base the comparisons. But unless you have a better idea, right. I don't, you know, who cares about your stupid criticism? You know, you have to come <laughs> up with a better idea. And then he, he had 10 teams of economists rank order the goals and then averaged across the teams of economists. And he said, well, look, here's some goals that have like a $200 to $1 return on investment. And most of those, and the, the goals included such things as climate change amelioration, but that fell to something like number 20. So there, there were way more economically effective um, um, steps forward. Most of those had to do with child nutrition and public mm, health. Absolutely. The, the return on investment was so high. And you look at that and you think, well, that's a no-brainer. And some countries are using it. Lomberg has done his analysis for Haiti, if I remember correctly, um, for a couple of provinces in India. Uh, I can't bring all the countries to mind at the moment. But I've never seen anyone do that as a matter of policy. I think it's brilliant. It's a brilliant administrative innovation. But and, I've never seen it used. And so necessary. So in oh, the absence. Absolutely. In the absence of that, you know, where I was going with, with my own personal experience, in the absence of seeing that, it was, it was eating at me and nobody was having that discussion. And I knew that if I put that out, if I put that message out, like, hey, we got to look at this thing globally, we got to look at world hunger, which some estimates say can be resolved for about 300 billion and clean water right. for the world that can be resolved for 120 billion and the end right, of right. child slavery, which could be resolved for, you know, some amount, like we got to look at these other things along with every everything that's going on with the pandemic and all of this let's just have a holistic conversation knowing that if i put that out people who have an ideology and have a lot of fear would attack me but i was in in a way the the moments that i hesitated the longer i hesitated which is that inaction that you were talking about yeah. i was choking on myself i was getting like more and more small like I, there was a a deep deep problem that was festering inside me as yeah, I wasn't you get able smaller, to. You get smaller and the thing you're fighting gets bigger, at, at yeah. least in your imagination, but totally. also sometimes in reality. Yep. And then I put it out and of course I get some criticism, but I get also a lot of love and a lot of praise. And it was like I could breathe again. And I think that's the thing that people don't understand is these things, okay, yes, I knew that I was going to expose myself to criticism. Blogs came and called me all sorts of names because of this opinion, which really was, let's just talk about everything. You know, that was really my only thesis, but they took their own biases and made me out to be a villain in whatever way. But nonetheless, my act of doing it was the best thing for my own human thriving and health. And I hope it actually contributed in some positive way to the outcome well, I was aiming at. But for me, it was essential. A fair bit of both of my last two books, but I would say particularly the last one, Beyond Order, the new one, is um, what would you say, encouragement to people to watch themselves, to pay attention, not to think, but just to watch. It's like, and so one chapter is called, I think it's chapter five, is called Do Not Do What You Hate. Mm. And what does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean geez, I hate getting up at eight o'clock in the morning to get ready for work. That just means that you're not very disciplined, you know, or, or maybe that it might mean something deeper. But I'd start with lack of discipline before, you know, rearranging your whole life. Because you might say, well, I hate getting up at eight o'clock in the morning, no matter what I'm doing, and then it's not your job. I don't mean don't do difficult things. I mean, watch yourself. And if you see that you're doing things that make you hate yourself, then consider the cost of continuing. Just notice, like, because you're reporting to yourself, just like you just said. In some sense, that wasn't a voluntary decision. You noticed that you couldn't breathe unless you discussed this issue. It's like, well, why is that? You don't know. You can't control it even. I mean, you can not do it and pay the consequences, but you can't say to yourself easily, well, that's stupid. I should be able to breathe <laughs> just because I haven't said this thing that shouldn't stop me from breathing, but there it is. You know, and the wise people that I've read, often associated with the establishment of the, of the Christian church, actually, this seems to be something that was a, a continual topic of discussion, noted continually that we do things that we can't control, and we're subject to forces that we can't control, and those are forces that are associated with our own destiny, I suppose, certainly our own conscience. You, you, 
you, you, and you just have to watch, you find out who you are. I'm the person who has to say this, why? I don't know exactly, but I know that if I don't do it, there's going to be a price. Yeah, absolutely. One of the sections of your book that I really loved, it was chapter two, where you get into alchemy and you get into, you know, a discussion of, uh, it was one of the richest chapters for me. Helen and you, Lewis said I sounded like a stoned undergraduate. <laughs> I, well, I must so like stoned undergraduate. It was so interesting, eh? Because this is, she, she wrote this review in The Atlantic. Um, and I was talking about, sorry, I'll let you get back to this right away. But sure. she was talking about, I commented on this, uh, the snitch in Harry Potter. Because I found that it's a very old symbol. That's a really old symbol. It shocked me to death that she used it. I couldn't believe she used it because it's really obscure, this symbol. And so I talk about it in the book. And, she, you know, that's what she dismissed as the ravings of a, of a, you know, stoned undergraduate. But then I thought, well, look, Rowling is richer than the queen. <laughs> she came from nothing. She produced this empire. It's an absolute empire. Books that's, that were 600 pages long that she could read to children in stadiums. A whole string of movies that dominated the entertainment landscape for like six years. It was a, uh, it was a, cultural, a global cultural phenomenon. It's like, well, don't you think that's worth looking into? That's what makes you a stoned undergraduate? It's, or are you so clueless that you can't see that when something like that happens, there's a mystery. It's why in the world would the story of a magical orphan become a multi-billion dollar, decades long, global cultural phenomenon? Well, if you're interested in culture, if you're interested in anything besides narrow politics, you'd think that that would be a, you'd think that would be worthy of investigation. It's not easy to see these things sometimes for the mystery that they are. No doubt. So, and I think it's anyway. what you say about stories. Mm -hmm. Stories can be true stories. The story of Harry Potter and the snitch is a true story because it's mm -hmm. in resonance with a real idea, something that's in the collective consciousness, something that's in our primordial psyche in a way. And so when we hear it, well, otherwise portrayed, it wouldn't be collective. Exactly. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't all enjoy it. And look, we can go to those movies. We suspend disbelief willingly instantly and we get immersed in the story that's magic that's magic what's going on it's mm. worthy of investigation yeah. so anyways i i, I sort of sidetracked that well that's actually exactly where i was going so okay. i'm going to read okay. i'm going to read this section and you're talking about the snitch as the uh alchemical symbol of the round chaos and you say this the seeker is the person who is playing the game that everyone else is playing and who is a disciplined expert at that game but who is also playing an additional higher order game, the pursuit of what is of primary significance. The snitch, like the round chaos, can therefore be considered the container of that primary significance. So for those of us who don't know the Harry Potter movie, there's a game called Quidditch, and it's basically like lacrosse, and you try to get the ball in the goal, but there's a seeker who actually is seeking this magical golden orb, which has alchemical kind of roots and in the round chaos. And if they seek that, the game is over. And it's been given that, you know, additional, as you say, primary significance. And this concept was really, really interesting to me to have it unpacked. Cause I didn't, I watched some Harry Potter and I saw it and I saw the game. That of course didn't occur to me. It was just like, oh, this is the rules to this game. But then I realized in my own life, there's the game that I'm playing. Oh, I'm running on it and I'm doing these things. But what is my snitch? What is my round chaos? What is that? ultimate higher order potential that I'm seeking. And so my question was, have you thought about for you, because we can obviously see the game being played as far as the normal Quidditch game, but for you personally, what is your, what is your snitch? What is your round chaos that you're seeking the game within the game that you're playing at large? Well, what's always attracted my attention predominantly. So, so let me unpack some things here. Is sure. that, um, some, some of the interpretation of that symbol, a lot of it came from my reading of Jung, because he's the only person that I've ever read who seems to know about such things, even knows that they exist. Jung believed that you, your interest, which is a relatively involuntary phenomenon, right? You get interested in things, but, but you can't make yourself interested in something. 
the interest grabs you and and grasps your attention and so Jung thought of that as a deeply seated biological mechanism, which it obviously is. It's a neurological mechanism of some sort that governs, it possesses, it, it has the capacity to possess your voluntary attention. Just like hunger does. When, when you get hungry, you're typing away, writing a book or something, and you get hungry, hunger starts to grab your attention. Well, look, you're interested in some things and you're not interested in others. Well, why? Well, some of that has to do with your choice, but, but not that much. A lot of it has to do with who you are in the deepest sense. And Jung believed that you were likely to become interested in things that furthered your development, furthered your psychological development, made you more and more competent. So, for example, you might get interested, you might really come to admire someone, and so what they do grabs your interest. And that happens with children quite a lot. And they get interested in kids who are slightly ahead of them in the developmental curve. And then they mimic them. And so you're, the interest is something that grabs you to move you forward on the developmental curve. And so it's, it's, the, it's the manifestation of your potential higher self in the present. And Jung described that as the self. The self was, in his view, the totality of your being. It's not definable. It includes you in the future, and you are, you are, in some sense, something that's coming to be into the future, uh, hopefully to be more than you are, although, you know, not always, because we also degenerate. In any case, your interest pulls you along on a particular developmental pathway. I've always been gripped, in some sense, by things that are very, very dark. Um, and the, uh, most of what's by pathology of, of one sort or another, which is, of course, partly why I'm a clinical psychologist, you know, but mm -hmm. I wanted to remediate it. I wanted to help. But, but it, was, it was the compulsion to investigate the darkest of darkness. And whether that's been good for me or not, well, that's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's a different question. I suppose it has been extremely good in some ways, and it's been, it's been complicated. We could certainly say that. But, but then more, I, I wanted to figure out what... what what would protect us from, from that darkness. And I guess it was because I was so shocked, existentially shocked, when I first encountered writings that pertain to the Holocaust and to other genocidal acts of that sort. And I was always interested in that for some reason from a psychological perspective. It's like, what compelled people to do that? And how can we not do it again? And that, so, so anyways, anything that, that focused on that grabbed my interest. That's mm -hmm. why I read Jung uh, extensively and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn. Those are the people I ran across, others as well, that, who seemed to have some answers as far as I could tell. And um, so that's what it's been for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, and, and I don't know why. It might be my proclivity towards depression. I really have no idea, you know, I'm, I'm a creative person by temperament, and I also have this depressive illness. Maybe it's the consequence of those two. I don't mm. know. Who knows, right? Who knows what, what, what pulls you forward? The ancients, the ancients would typically externalize these forces you mm. know, when they couldn't understand it. And you talk about that with the god Mercury. The god Mercury was yeah. the one that drew you to these different things. But yeah, Greek... it's got, he's got wings and he flitters, and it's that's what your attention does. It pulls. It's like in Up, that uh, that Pixar movie. Every yeah. time there's a squirrel, the dog, <laughs> <laughs> that's their snitch. They, they that's yeah. the grip of instinctual forces. It's very comical, but but it's it, and see in human beings, I think it's unbelievably sophisticated because I do believe that we're compelled to follow a line that leads to our further development, and I do think that that involves mimicry of the hero, for example. Um, the hero, psychologically speaking, is that figure which represents a, a, a potential stage of development for you. And you'll find your hero because you'll admire something or mm. someone. And why is that? Well, something's, well, I gave you the best explanation for that that I can. That's, that's the future you, in some sense, manifesting itself in the present, saying, here's where you could go. Yeah. And that's another, the instinct for growth. Another aspect that they externalized was the idea of the daemon, which is almost like the uh, the mercurial impulse 
that's taken and stretched out for a long time. It's something that's continually drawing you towards yeah. some potential realization of what you're capable of. And they put that again in, in this kind of demigod landscape. But of course, that was just their way of understanding things. Well, Although, but it, it also makes a tremendous amount of sense. Like sure. to, to make to make um, rage a god like Mars. Well, yes. Why? Well, it's immortal. I mean, rage will be here long after you're gone. <laughs> you're definitely, it's pawn at times. You know, it's not obvious who's in control when you're enraged. Yeah. In fact, at, at some levels of rage, that can even be a legal defense because we recognize that you can be out of your head. Your normal personality isn't in control. And really powerful motivational forces have that transcendent, reality it's not a, and it, rage is older than human beings it's really really old and it it can have you in its grip sexual impulses the same way hunger all of these things are are unbelievably powerful forces and they don't just operate on the primordial level as far as i'm concerned there there are sophisticated gods of motivation and yeah. we we are um possessed by them when we do such things as go to movies we don't notice is what the hell are we doing watching this movie? Why are we entertained by it? Why does it grip our interest? We don't know. We don't even question it. It's like, well, it's entertaining. It's fun. It's interesting. If it's interesting, you don't have to justify it. <laughs> then you think, right? Well, that's, so, that's interesting True. in and of itself. If it's interesting, you don't justify it. And then someone can tap you on the head and say, look what you're doing. And you think, Oh, yeah, that's kind of odd that I'm doing that. What the hell am I doing <laughs> standing in line for three days to see Star Wars when I'm an atheistic engineer? Right. What's going on here? Oh, look at that. It's a, it's a religious impulse. Yeah. And, and I don't have a religion, and so this is filling the gap, and that's why I go to Star Wars conventions, and, and it, I'm possessed by something that I haven't pursued. Mm. One of the things that you wrote was really powerful for me to read because to me, I think it described my snitch, my round chaos, that thing that I'm seeking underneath the games that I'm playing. And so I'm going to read this little snippet here. Who could you be? You could be all that a man or woman might be. You could be the newest avatar in your own unique manner of the great ancestral heroes of the past. What is the upper limit to that? We do not know. Our religious structures hint at it. How would someone who determined to take full responsibility for the tragedy and malevolence of the world manifest itself? The ultimate question of man is not who we are, but who we could be. That's it for me. I mean, for me, I read that. I was like, yep, that's it. There's the snitch with its wings and its golden, you know, mercurious allure that I'm, that I've, I'm really chasing underneath all of this. And I enjoy all these other things, but who could but, you be? Exactly. You see that in children. I watched little children play, and what what they're doing, you know, they're 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 attempting to grow forward, but they toy with with identities. I'm I'm a, my my little granddaughter. I wrote about her in this book too. It's so funny watching her. She, she had Pocahontas, the Disney movie, and she had a Pocahontas doll, and she watched that movie a number of times, and then for. Well, it's been a year now. She's only three and a half for a whole year. She has two names, Scarlett and Ellie. Um, and uh, one's her middle name, but, but she's called one or the other and, and is, seems to be perfectly comfortable with both. Um, if you ask her if she's Ellie, she'll say yes. And if you ask her if she's Scarlett, she'll say yes. But if you ask her if she's Pocahontas, she'll also say yes. And then if you ask her if she is Scarlett, Ellie, or Pocahontas, she'll say she's Pocahontas. And she's been, she's been insisting on that for a whole year. And so she's playing out this role. I don't know how much of her imagination is devoted to it, but enough for this trip. Like that's, if you're, how old are you? 40, 40 something? 40, just turned 40. Yeah, okay. So, you know, imagine that you had a fictional identity for 15 years. That's approximately the same relative length of time. And the kids, you know, they, they weave up a fantasy world and then they play out an identity in that. And then they weave out another fantasy world and they play out an identity with that. And they shape that identity by their interactions with other children and adults. 
and hopefully they find an identity that suits them that other people also accept because your identity has to be something that other people accept or it isn't going to work for you. But that's all part of this exploration of who they could be. Mm. You know, it's the play is in fact the, the, the exercising of that realm of possibilities. And so a good father, a good parent for that matter, but I think this, I think at least is an archetypally paternal role, puts a border of security around the child you know, and the mother might be inside that border of security when she has young children. And play can take place there. And the play is the investigation of multiple identities with the hope of finding one that is functional, that is also socially desired, because those things can't be dissociated. One of the reasons I think that the identity politics has bothered me so much, speaking of snitches, you know, it's bothered me. It's like, this bothers me. And I've only recently realized that some of it had to do with what I saw as limitations on free speech, which is I have to say the words that, you know, some authority or some population demands that I say, which I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something else too, which is that it's based on a very misleading theory of identity. Your identity is not just who, how you feel about yourself at this moment. And you can't impose that on other people because they don't know how to deal with that. Like, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't know the rules of the game. You have to negotiate your identity with other people. And so then you have to think of identity as something that's negotiated with other people. And so if you, if you have an implicit theory of identity, like the one that seems to be increasingly dominating the cultural landscape, which is identity is something that's only subjectively determined and can also change from moment to moment, then you're misleading people as they develop because they come up with a very unsophisticated notion of what identity is. And that's right. not good because it, <laughs> that's, a, that's core. And I, part of your identity is your value to other people. That's a huge part of it. And that's not subjective. That's other people make that decision. Yeah. So, and you, and you talk about that in, uh, I think it's chapter three, where you say that's one of the ways we keep our sanity is talking to other people and the interaction with our community and, and all of these other things that isolate us more and more to a, to a single yeah. subjective perspective is going to lead to a certain madness. You it know, it is definitely, de well, that, exactly. Well, I tried to impress upon some of the trans activists that were after me when I first made some public statements. I said, look, I don't think, I didn't say it this eloquently, unfortunately. I said, what I, what, I, what I would have liked to have said now, at least, was it isn't obvious to me at all that your theory of identity is going to serve the function that you assume it is. It's not psychologically sophisticated enough. It's not sociologically sophisticated enough. You can't insist that other people play a game that they don't know how to play especially when you also don't know how to play it, except to say that it exists. So, and this sanity issue is, you know, a lot of us is externalized because we're such social creatures and everyone has weaknesses. You know, you're going to de degenerate along your weakest axis. And if you're fort and you won't be able to control yourself because some of your weakness will be precisely that inability to control yourself on that axis. Like maybe, maybe you have a biological predisposition to alcoholism and you know, you have three shots of vodka in 20 minutes and you're like on top of the world. You know, um, there are people like that. They often have extensive family histories of alcoholism. It's a biological uh, phenomenon. Uh, you can tell if you're like that, if it's really difficult for you to stop drinking once you start, it's a mm -hmm. real warning sign and means alcohol is a great drug for you, subjectively speaking. But, you know, hopefully, when you drink too much, other people are going to start telling you. It's like, no, you're... And that's actually how you start diagnosing alcohol abuse. Are you getting in trouble with the law? Is it interfering with your intimate relationships? Is it interfering with your ability to hold a job? It means that the, the addictive substance is starting to dominate your life in a, in a manner that's counterproductive. And other people are there to ensure that you stay balanced enough so that you don't deteriorate entirely. You're lucky if you have that. And the, part of the point I make in that chapter, and I would say in both books and in Maps of Meaning as well, is that the primary obligation of a 
parent is to serve as a proxy for the social and the natural world. But let's say the social world. Why? Well, because you want to train your child to be not only acceptable socially, but highly desirable socially. And the reason for that is that by the time they're about three, three to four is the transition period, they're going to be spending more time being socialized by their peers than by you. And that will increasingly be the case as they develop. And if you haven't made them, if you haven't encouraged them through judicious attention to be socially desirable, they're going to be rejected by their peers. And then they fall farther and farther behind on the developmental trajectory. So, well, so yeah. that's partly how you help them with their identity. They sure. can't be the sort of person that insists that everyone else always play the game they chose. And it's honoring that they, they, they can play whatever game they want for themselves. Like your, like your granddaughter, she can play Pocahontas. And, you know, if she wants to have that identity as Pocahontas, great. But to demand and to shame anybody who decides to call her Ellie, for example you know, who just doesn't know any better, knows that name. That's where I think it gets really, that's where the ugliness of it comes out. Like the, the freedom to express ourselves how we want, but then softening the edges of this, of this thing and just recognizing, okay, you know, if you're, if you know somebody and they really prefer to be called something, it was like when I was 30, I changed my name from, uh, one of my middle names was Chris and the other middle name was Aubrey. My legal name was Michael and it was all a big mess. I decided to take my grandfather's name, Aubrey. So there was a window there where my identity changed, well, at least the name, from Chris to Aubrey. And so lots of people would call me Chris, and I would just gently say, hey, uh, you know, I, I changed my name to Aubrey. And, but whatever, it wouldn't, like cause a, it wouldn't be a screeching halt to the, to the day or anything like that. And it would just be gentle encouragement that I didn't take personally because I wasn't attached to that identity as the end-all, be-all. I attached to, I am an infinite being, a, a, a point, a locus of consciousness that is embodying a certain identity at this transitory time. This is my own personal spiritual belief. And that to me is the solid ground, right? So these other things, this is, this is how we play. This is the way, as Ramdas said, this is us being God in drag, right? Like this is us playing out our role. And it's, in my opinion, it's fine to play out another role. But the moment you get so attached to that infinitesimal aspect of self and build these walls rather than opening up the community that's where i think it it leads to the result as you said it leads to a result that you're not actually desiring in trying to and trying to you know do this change this identity well that's what i saw as the danger i would say is that it was the, the use of force you right. know, which which is what happens when you put something into law it's force is not only implied but <laughs> relatively you know stated relatively explicitly and then there was the problem with the you know, paucity of identity and the interference with, with free speech. Um, and I, I don't think that those concerns were misplaced. I think that there's something about that issue that's central to the continuing culture war. It is a war to some degree about what constitutes identity, but at least we should have a more sophisticated notion of identity. It, it, it's, it's just not helpful otherwise. I mean, part of what I was doing constantly as a clinical psychologist was helping people craft an ever more sophisticated identity. And what you want, you want to have the kind of identity that makes people line up to want to play with you. And if you ever have to use force, well, that's, look, sometimes force is inescapable. But if you have to use force to get people to comply, it is a sign that you're not playing a very good game. Now, mm. maybe you don't, you can't think up a better one. There's nothing that's going to work. A state of emergency might, you know, because we allow governments to use extra force during a state of emergency. But nobody thinks that's optimal. Yep. So if people won't play because you're inviting them, then the game isn't configured very well. And it's very unlikely to be stable. So... Yep. Yep. So as we're trying to, you know, understand that thing that we're aiming at with our identity, just like your granddaughter's aiming at Pocahontas because of certain attributes that really resonate with her, a lot of us have an amalgamation of certain stories. I know for me, there's lots of heroic stories from, 
you know, m- lots of times movies, sometimes different things. A, a play, Cyrano de Bergerac, was a major, you know, cornerstone of of an identity that I really admired. And when he said something like, "When troubled by all the many possibilities that lay before me, I decided to be admirable at everything," I was like, "Aha, that's my guy." You know. And then there is another aspect of something I saw from William that Wallace. Aha. That aha yeah. is a very interesting reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an insight response. It looks like it's right hemisphere mediated. And it is, I would say, the initial manifestation of the next stage of identity. So imagine that you, it's sort of a Piagetian theory in some sense. You're at a particular stage right now. And that stage would involve a particular worldview and the behaviors that go along with that. So the perceptions and behaviors. But it's not enough because you haven't mastered the whole world and you're making mistakes all the time. And then there's other neurological mechanisms that, so maybe that's a more left hemisphere phenomenon, the instantiation of that identity. Um, Then there's right hemisphere mechanisms that are tracking your errors and sort of keeping track of them. And the errors are an indication that your theory is incomplete. So it acu- the errors accumulate and the information around the errors accumulate and another identity starts to become formulated and it, it solves all the problems your previous identity did, but also some additional ones. When you have an aha moment like that, it's the manifestation of that next identity that's, that's making itself known. It's, it's mm. you know, because it's being built from the bottom up. It isn't explicit yet. And then you'll encounter an explicit statement. You, you, you mentioned a couple there. And they map onto that. And that's the aha. It's like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's what ties together these things that I've been wrestling with in the back of my mind. Right? Someone made it explicit. And that's mm-hmm. what, well, that's one of the great things about language. That can also help fill in the gaps, too. Because you, yeah. you, know, you, you can start to make arguments based on that observation. That aha. That's, that's, that, that's the manifestation of the snitch, too. So, yep. Hang, oh, look, that interested me. Hmm, that's pulling me along somewhere. Where is it going? Well, hopefully it's going to the next me. This is also why, you know, in, in book one, in, in 12 Rules, I said, don't tell the truth or at least don't lie. Well, why? Well, fundamentally, because if you deceive yourself repeatedly, You'll mess up. You mess up your identity. You mess up the neurology, for that matter. It it no longer produces outputs that map on well to the world. What that'll mean is that your interest starts to become pathologized, and then you're really in trouble because your interest manifests itself involuntarily. And so, if you mess up the machinery that unconsciously orients you, that you don't have control over, but that has control over you, you're lost. You're lost. There's nothing that can lead you back. And that should terrify you three quarters to death. It's like, don't mess with those unconscious instincts. Don't put garbage in the system so that you start being interested in things that are going to take you somewhere you don't want to go. So, yeah. Or enmeshment with people. You know, if you get enmeshed with another individual, a group of friends, that could be, or it could be a partner, and you start to have that groupthink phenomenon where all of a the sudden their ideas become your ideas, which has nothing to do with your snitch and your daemon and your aspirational avatar that you're modeling yourself off, but you're just co-opting somebody else's. Well, it's a, it's a tough one, you know, and, and I, I laid that out in both of these books. Um, you, you, you've, you're writing these two, uh, <laughs> You're caught between two forces which are very constructive and very destructive. So look, you have to go along with the crowd. You know, the, t- the typical parent says to his teenage son or her teenage son, you know, if Sam jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? And the answer should be no, of course not. But not exactly. You know, maybe, it's, maybe the bridge is 12 feet high and it's a test of courage. And you should jump off the damn bridge. And maybe going along with your friends means that you're being properly socialized, you know, and Mm. you're doing it despite what your parents want. So that's actually a marker of independence. And maybe you're at a stage where succumbing to peer pressure means playing with others. Now, the danger is you lose your path, right? You lose, you gain what's common to you and everyone else, but you lose what's unique to you. But you can't say, well, just pursue your own unique individuality. Hmm. 
I mean, virtually every cartoon animated movie now that's made for kids has the underlying theme of you're a unique individual and you should pursue your unique individuality. It's like, yeah, no, not exactly. First of all, that could be a form of insanity and could and 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 might well be. And second, you have to be a cog in the machine. Now, you you shouldn't be nothing but a cog in the machine. That's a mistake because the machine might malfunction and it might be headed in the wrong direction and all of that. It can be pathological. That's the pathology of order. But but that doesn't mean that you can dismiss peer pressure and succumbing to it. It's like, well, yeah, psychopaths don't succumb to peer pressure ever. Mm. And finding the balance between those extremes. This mm-hmm. is a theme that shows up in so much of your work, which is highlighting these two extreme, these two extreme positions and then saying it's neither this or this, but it's both this and this to the certain appropriate degree. In a, yes. And dyna- it's, it's like music. And I make that case in chapter eight, which is make one room in your house as beautiful as possible. Music speaks of the continual, what, harmony of, 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 what would you say? The balance of opposing forces, something like that. And it it constantly changes and moves within a domain. Um, You want to pursue that kind of harmonious balance. In the first chapter, I said, uh, don't, casually denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. And there's a political argument there, right? An implicit political argument, because the conservatives are on the side of the social institutions, by and large, and the liberals, by and large, are on the side of creative achievement. It's like, well, those two do exist in tension, but the tension can never be entirely resolved because creative achievement can undermine order. But order degenerates without being updated and creative achievement updates. And so we're stuck with that. These are, these are existential per- permanence. That's why I, in my first book, I, I called it the architecture of belief. And, and it's about what I think of as ex- existential permanence. They, they never go away. You never, you never, if you're human, you always have to deal with the pathology and utility of culture with the danger and promise of nature and with the good and evil that exist in your own soul. Mm. That's humanity. And no matter who you are, you have those problems. They'll never go away. And the solution is to constantly find a solution. Yeah. That's, there's no final, death is the only final solution to that problem, set of problems. It's juggling. And it's in the juggling that the solution is to be found. <clears throat> it's too bad because, you know, and that's the problem with utopian thinking. This is why Dostoevsky, in his genius, realized, he said, look, if you gave people what they wanted, all the cake they could possibly eat, surrounded them with material comfort, and what did he say, until they have nothing to do but busy themselves with the continuation of the species and eat cake, <laughs> they, they would immediately break the structure. They'd tear it down violently just so something unexpected could happen. And that's, I, I read that, just that, that was in Notes from Underground. It just knocked me over. It's like, yes, that's right. There, there isn't a final state where everyone will be happy because they've been provided with what they need. It's God. It's not that simple. No. And, and there'd be and no point in life, I suppose, if it was that simple. Because you could just solve the problem and be done with it. And understanding that, we can look out at the world and we can say, I can't believe this is happening. Why is this happening? Oh, oh, woe is me. And, and, or we can say, you know what? I'm here for this. This is the challenge that's presented. These are the dragons that have appeared out of the ethers. And, but I am, I am the hero of my own story. And I'm going to, and, and really it goes back to how you and your community and your, and your tribe, so to speak, you know, which is made of your family and your dear friends, your ohana, your community, how are you going to stand against the challenges? But that most important thing is you saying, I'm here for this. Like, I'm here for this. This is the dragon. Oh, well, I'm a hero. I'm always going to be here for a dragon. It appears this way right now. So be it. And that's where the hero has that kind of smile well, of, the, the, here I am. The, 
the alternative doesn't seem productive. Yeah. You know, in chapter 11, which is, do not allow yourself to become deceitful, arrogant, or resentful. Um, it's kind of a summary chapter of everything I've ever written, I would say. I kind of outline the reasons why people become deceitful, arrogant, and resentful. And we have our reasons. It's, it's, in some sense, it's a miracle that it doesn't happen all the time. And so I say, well, here's, here's the problem. You know, death chases you, you're mortal, and, and illness will be a part of your life and a part of the lives of people you love. And it will be terrible, terrible, maybe beyond your imagining. You're stuck with that, man. And culture, there's a tyrannical aspect. It crushes you and turns you into a cog and maybe destroys the, wor the best in you to some degree. You're stuck with that. And then you, Christ, you know, you're just a massive contradictions and trouble. You can't get yourself organized. You're doing all sorts of things you don't want to do and not doing the things you know you should do and, you know, putting obstacles in your path just so you can trip over them. Well, there's the landscape. Well, why would you turn to the dark side, let's say, in, in the face of that? It's like, no wonder, obviously. But it doesn't help. It, makes, it seems to make everything worse. So, and it doesn't seem, if you're objecting to the fact that things are bad, it doesn't seem that making them worse is a tenable solution. It's an attractive solution at times because people think, they think deeply, oh, to hell with this, you know, it's so awful that I'll just add to the misery out of spite. And man, I, if you don't see the compulsion of that argument, either you're not, I don't know, maybe you're fortunate, maybe you're fortunate, you're sheltered, maybe you're saint-like. That would be good, but, but it, it, and you see this in clinical practice all the time, voluntary confrontation with what is threatening and unknown tends to be curative and not always, you know, like there are, there are mistakes people make. So for example, you often see these trauma teams rush in to talk to people just after say a mass shooting or some kind of terrorist attack and like it does not help people to have them review the trauma that they're currently experiencing not unless it's problem solving oriented it can just make it worse but if it's an old memory well then voluntary recall and explicit reformulation seems to be useful mm. or at least it's better than anything else we know right that doesn't mean it always works yeah and the pragmatism of all of these things i think is beautiful to explore because you don't take them at face value well of course you should do this but you actually take the time to think about it and come up with the pragmatic reasons for it and uh, and i really appreciate that about all of your work as we close here um you know i'd just like to offer you a moment to talk directly to the people listening who want to take that stand want to be the hero of their own story and uh, and just give them a, a few words of encouragement as they look out into our into our landscape, look deep into their own into their own chaos, into their own soul, and uh, and and want to bring out the best that's possible for them. Well, I would say you know the first decision you have to make is whether you want things to be better or worse. And it it seems to me that better is a better aim, and if that's what you want, then you can orient yourself to becoming fully on board with that. That's your motif. And I would say that's love in the religious sense is that love is the desire that all things flourish. And you might think that's evident. It's like, it's not evident. This is hard because things are difficult. It's easy to become spiteful and bitter and resentment, resentful and to be self-denigrating and not to work for your own furtherance because you're ashamed of who you are, like deeply ashamed, maybe even ashamed to be human. The destructive species that we are constantly raping the planet, you know, that, that self-loathing can go very, very deep. So this is, this is hard. And, it, and so, the, but that's the first thing. Do you want things to be better or worse for you and for the people around you? It's like, well, so that's your goal, to make them better. Perhaps that's your goal. When I was a clinician, 
that's what I was always working on with my clients was like, I'm on the side of you that's aimed at making things better. Mm -hmm. No unconditional positive regard because there's going to be parts of you that are working at, at counter purposes to that. And we're not on their side. They're to be judged and dis dispensed with, not in a, not in a contemptuous or dismissive manner, but with the knowledge that those elements of your personality are not serving the goal. And that doesn't mean that that might be bringing them on board. So if you're aggressive, that can serve the good that can make you persistent and, 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 and committed and, and, immo and, and immovable, all those things. And then the next thing I would say is um, try not to try Watch for resentment, arrogance, and deceit. They're your enemies. Mm -hmm. And see if you can reduce the influence they have over your life. And then that's where you have to watch and feel, am I lying? Is this self-serving? Is what I'm saying making me weak? Can I feel that? Am I insisting that I'm right? Because I'd rather be I'd rather believe that I was right than learn. Um, am I taking revenge in a resentful way? Those are good questions of conscience. It's highly probable that you're doing that in many places. Maybe you can dispense with that carefully over time mm. and see what happens. So <laughs> it's and worth running the experiment. Yeah. And, and putting our everything into it, because that's where we'll really learn, you know, by, by giving, giving that endeavor. Well, that's towards a good aim. aim. It's a yep. good aim, you know, you, but you can start with even a little couple of percents of you aim towards that. <laughs> you yeah. can start badly. And that's a useful thing to know, too, is like, you, you know, you can improve your life a little bit at a time. And it's very difficult to be all in. You know, we yeah. talked about that earlier. Who knows who you could be if you were everything you could be? I, that is that is an, a limitless case. You know, what would it be like if you stopped doing all the stupid things that you're doing and took advantage of all the opportunities that came your way and aimed at the highest good? Who knows what you could be? You could certainly be more than you are. Everyone knows that, I think, and everyone suffers that knowledge. You know, that's from, it's from that their feelings of inadequacy spring that can be pathologized too. You know, I mean, I know people can have be way harder on themselves than is actually good for them. That's mm -hmm. not what I mean. I, 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 it's hard to distinguish between those even, but, but it can be done, I think. And we're all here, you know, waiting to see that story unfold, you know, all of your community, everybody in your community, you know, there may be some jealousies and there may be some other factors. There may be some people rooting against you. They're probably not your community and you just haven't revealed that yet. But we're all waiting and watching to see your story unfold. We're waiting to see what that answer is. What can you be? And that's inspiring. That's a story that's going to be told and lived out in this life. And everybody who watches you live that story will be inspired by that because they'll be inspired to live their own story. And, uh, and that's, I think, the most important message is, you know, live, live as the hero and allow that to be, you know, the fable that has grandchildren saying, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be whoever your name is, you know, I'm going to be this person because you lived in such an inspiring way. And that's, uh, you know, that's what draws me forward. And uh, I think draws all the heroes forward of our, of our time. And, and that's, uh, that's what we need right now. And we don't, that isn't done at someone's expense. Yeah. You know, not if it's done right. It's done with the benefit of everyone else in mind. And that's a case I try to make in the book too. Like if you're acting in your own self-interest, because you're a community that stretches across time, you have to take your own future self into account constantly. And so impulsive selfishness is not useful, even selfishly. And so... And so you can make the most out of yourself, I believe, without taking anything away from anyone else. It's, it's only beneficial. Now, you know, people might be annoyed at you because you're more successful on some dimension than they are, and perhaps that hurts. But, well, if to deal with that, we'd have to eradicate the 
possibility of ever being better at anyone, of anyone ever being better than anyone else at anything. And it doesn't seem to me that we want to push equality that far. Yeah, that would be a nightmare for sure. But it I would. think... It, yes, that, and I think at the, dar the darkest edges of the e demand for equality have that horror at, at their root. It's like, well, you're going to take away from everyone what they have to offer by insisting that everything is equal. It's like, no, no. You want people to be able to trade the best they have with other people. That's a good deal for everyone. And I think the, the solution is, again, you talk about this, the absence of that divine understanding and we may have different understandings of the divine but when you start to say that the actual goodness or betterness of a person is only limited to the identity dimension and the accomplishment dimension of their existence well that's where you run into the problem but when you can say in the eyes of god all people are equal which is a truism that i see at that point you say listen everybody we are all equal. There is equality, absolute radical equality in the eyes of the divine. And that divine spark, the monad that we carry in our center of centers, we're equal. Now let's allow the flourishing of difference and development to make this life fucking interesting. You know, let's, uh, let's celebrate all of the differences and the struggles and the challenges and how everything goes because equality is already the foundation. So now we can celebrate everything else without getting too lost in all of these different games. Yeah, well, that is a danger. It's a danger that we'll lose that as we lose our religious traditions because that presupposition of transcendent equality, which is a very strange proposition, but I think, I think you formulated something about it very well, which is that, well, it allows us to answer a certain question, is that equality is a value. And so we, we assume that everyone has a transcendent value and that that transcendent value is of equal value. And great, that, that makes everyone sovereign. That's, that's the source of your natural rights. It's the reason that culture has to respect you as a sovereign individual. You bring something to the table as a consequence of your being. And having established that, as you pointed out, well, perhaps we can tolerate the differences that remain or even say, and that, that is what you do if you celebrated diversity. Like it's really become clear to me that the demand for diversity and equality are in, in terrible and irreconcilable conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. It's like if diversity means anything it means important difference and if important difference means anything it means inequality so you know that's going to be a tough nut to crack mm. to end this you know when you have when you have those quiet moments where you commune with the divine with god you know what is what is your process what is your what is the way that you that you pray that you commune with that with that impulse that seems you know so important in your writing and the essence of your being and even i will say you walking around when when we did this in person the last time the emanation of of love that you put out which can only come from a source that is both internal and beyond i i really witnessed and felt that from you not only in your work but in in the presence of who you are when you commune with that you know what is what is the way that that you access that uh that you know divinity well a lot of it is constant reminder especially now because i i have i'm in terrible pain almost all the time and i do mean terrible if if in my previous life when i was healthy i had ever felt like i always feel now i would have immediately gone to the emergency ward but it's not helpful there, as far as i can tell as far as i've been informed for that matter there isn't anything that can be done about the condition that I'm in. And that's rough. I have to remind myself all the time of what I should be doing, even to continue living for that matter. And I'm constantly reminding myself to be grateful and as an act of courage. And I, I do explain that a little bit in Beyond Order. Something I really realized about gratitude is that gratitude at one level is an act, it's a voluntary act of courage. And I'm not trying to make out a case for myself being particularly courageous. That isn't what I mean. I mean that it's a risk to be grateful. It, it's a decision that opens you up in some ways. And 
you're sort of grateful despite it all. Hmm. It's, an, it's a great gratitude, I suppose, as a, as a marker of faith. And, and that faith is even, in some sense, belief in the impossible. Despite all this, it's good. And I have to remind myself of that all the time. And, I, you know, I do, I do that with prayer. I mean, I say grace with my wife. At, me, at our, We only share one meal together. But we always say grace. And I actually think, in some sense, that's a really good part of my day, that little, the time we do that. Um, and that comes as somewhat of a surprise. And, and it's a relatively recent practice for the two of us. Not that we weren't trying to be grateful before, but we've both gone through our respective hells in the last two years because um, my wife had a very terrible cancer. It was terrible and terrible surgical complications. And she was on death's doorstep for months and months and months. Um, and in any case, we remind ourselves constantly, constantly to be grateful. And I'm always trying to watch what I say and, and to feel it out so that I don't, so that I use my words carefully. And it's, I'm attentive to that. Yeah. And despite, you know, despite temptation, because I'm very disheartened in many ways, uh, in many ways. Well, just from, you know, one, one person to another, you know, thank you for your courage to keep going. And, uh, and thank you for everything that you've offered thus far and that you will continue to offer as you've been an inspiration to so, so many people. Oh, it's been a included. great pleasure. I mean, really, it's so, and it's kept me alive. It's so interesting, I suppose, too, because, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to be of aid to people, let's say, um, and the consequence of that, I suppose, was that when I needed it the most, I got a lot of that back. And that wasn't something I expected. It's like when my wife was sick in the hospital, we had hundreds of letters of support. Prayer groups contacted us and, and, there, and well-wishers who said, we hope, we're praying, we want this to work out, we're thinking about you. It's like, wow, you know, that's great. It's sustaining. And certainly, um, I read the YouTube comments and so forth. And thank God, most of them are positive. <laughs> I, I don't know possibly how people live when that's not the case, you know, because negative ones strike me to the core. So I'm, I'm very I'm a very peculiar person for what I'm doing, actually, because I don't have that much resilience in the face of criticism. I'm very <laughs> sensitive to it. Um, but fortunately, there's, there seems to be a lot of support and constantly, thank God, it, it's a remarkable thing. And I can't believe it. I, I really can't believe it. And so... And I'm pleased people seem to be responding to this book positively. You know, I looked at some of the, I told you, I looked at some of the public uh, reviews mm -hmm. on Amazon, and there's not a lot of them yet, a couple dozen, but they seem to be trending in the direction that I would hope for. And so, good, I hope this book is helpful. I, I no tried doubt. to make it full of things that were helpful to me, you know. Um, there's no doubt. And in this, I have 10 pages of notes and so many of these are small, little, tangential, valuable subjects that we could talk, talk about and explore. But my life is truly enriched by the reading of this. And if, you know, well, I'm someone, really glad you like it. I'm really glad. Absolutely. Pleased. Absolutely. And as someone with a, as voracious an appetite to read and have discourse with individuals, for me to gain as much as I did from this work, I know that the world will be. And every one of those reviews and letters, as you understood when you were in, in politics, there's 10,000 more that are behind it. And, uh, and that's absolutely going to be the case with this one. So I'm curious about the, the formal reviewer responses. You know, they're always, they're often much more negative than the general <laughs> of course. reaction. Um, of course. Not always, but very often. And it's quite surprising. It's like there's a contempt for what I'm doing, independent of its intellectual merits, what I'm doing, or maybe even its moral merits for that matter. Um, there's a contempt for what I'm doing, which I find really off-putting. And I actually think that 
that contempt is at the heart of the, the proclivity now for populism to have emerged because it's kind of an elitist contempt, you know? And I can see that in the de denigrating comments about the population of people that I'm theoretically helping. You know, so maybe if it was only disaffected white males, which it is clearly not, um, even if it was only disaffected, angry, white, young males, it's like, well, is there actually something wrong with helping them? Like, is that to be, is there something about that that's to, to be disdained? It's, I don't understand that. It's, it's, it's a class contempt mm. that is at the core of what drives ordinary people's reaction. Which comes from in, an, in a deep-seated self-contempt, you know, a contempt of the whole, of the whole self. Because we are not, as, as you've said, we are not just one thing. We are a collection of so many different energies and archetypes and aspects. And so having and other contempt people. for the, and, and other, other people. people exactly you know those unredeemed masses the deplorables let's say if you don't think they're you there's something wrong with the way you're thinking <laughs> yeah. they're you man and like i can really feel that in me and maybe that's because i'm from a northern albertan rural background you know it's kind of like the texas of canada but i can feel this strong populist sympathy and i don't like I watch it and I'm informed by it and, and I'm not contemptuous of it. Um, I see that as part of me and it isn't necessarily the part that I want in the driver's seat. But I, I saw this, I was on Bill Maher's show at one point and you know, there was a handful of the intellectual types for whom this kind of contempt seems to come relatively easy. And they were having a laugh at the expense of the Trump voters. And I said, well, what are, what's your plan to live with these people? Since they're your neighbors and your family and your, you know, it's half the population. What's your plan for these contemptible people? And it just shut the conversation down completely. You know, it's like I threw a dead skunk on the, on the <laughs> table, <laughs> or maybe a live skunk. And it was an honest question. Yeah. So I don't, I don't get that. I, I, I don't understand that, me, that exactly. I, I don't understand why, and I, I, I don't get why what I'm doing is met with that kind of contempt. Especially think, because it's so it's such a lovely thing to engage in. No it's doubt. so fulfilling. I can't imagine doing anything that would be more meaningful. It's so lovely. I and don't understand it. And people's souls are drawn to that because the souls understand that everybody is us living a different life and we're deeply drawn to help everybody. And so when we see somebody else doing that, that brings up an inherent subconscious shame that we're not doing the same thing so we have to tear that down in order to cope with the shame that is arising yeah well that's you know one of the things i learned from jung which was really powerful I, it's so brilliant some of the things he figured out were so brilliant he was he and he tried to explain why revelation the book of revelation was appended to the end of the new testament because it's a very strange book i think it's a hallucinogenic trip i think it's i actually i think it's actually an account of a psilocybin mushroom experience um but in any case the christ in the gospels is quite merciful and one of jung's propositions was that there's an ancient line of religious thinking that has mercy and justice as the two hands of god Mer too much mercy is the devouring mother. Everything's okay. No one's ever called to account. And so no one ever matures and takes responsibility. But justice without mercy is too harsh because we all fall short of the mark. So God rules with a balance of justice and mercy. And the Christ in the Gospels, although there's hints of temper and judgment, he's presented in quite a merciful manner. But in the Revelation, he's, he's a judge. It's like, no, mm. you're unworthy and, and <laughs> the select are few. And you think, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, imagine 
sorting yourself out into the select and the, and the unworthy. Perhaps most of you is select, but I doubt it. And you certainly aren't going to start that way. You know, nothing that isn't approximating the ideal is select. So in any case, his proposition was that every ideal is a judge. And that makes perfect sense because an ideal is something to which you aspire. And the gap between you and that ideal, if it's your ideal, is felt as judgment. Mm. And so that's one of the reasons people are very afraid to have an ideal to make it. That's why I wrote, do not hide things in the fog. It's like, well, you should lay out an ideal. You should pursue an ideal. Why wouldn't you? Well, when you make your ideal explicit, it turns into your judge. Well, then you can listen to that judge and, and move forward and transform. But, you know, it's pretty damn harsh. Because to, especially to begin with, you posit an ideal, especially if you're in a mess. God, every bit of you is being judged as unworthy. Yeah. <laughs> There's endless reasons not to want that. And then the, the way forward is to have that ideal because those ideals are in some ways noble truths. These things about loving the collective because the collective is the same. It's true whether people want to adopt it or not, at least in my opinion, that there's things that our consciousness knows to be true. Well, so those I think are ideals true. that exist. I think it's true because you are, in fact, a, a community across time. Right. So, so there's no difference between what's good for you and what's good for other people. There's actually no difference. Not, yeah. if, you, not if you extend it far enough. They are technically the same thing. So, so, you, so you have this ideal that is there, whether you acknowledge it or not, and you feel it, mm -hmm. and you feel that thing. And then, but where it gets, you get tripped up is when you have an expectation that you're going to magically travel and teleport from where you are, which is full of your own corruptions and full of your own selfishness, to meet that ideal immediately. So the mercy comes from saying, this is the ideal, but the expectation of judgment that I'm going to be at that right away is false. So let me appreciate myself right here where I am in this journey with all of my faults, however many they are, open up my entire closet of internal monsters, pet them on the head and say, okay, here we go, eliminating more of those and becoming more like the ideal, surrendering to the journey rather than that expectation. And there, the judge no longer carries the sting and the bite and the harshness because it's you're judging yourself according to a timeline where you're hoping to get closer to this. Yes, well, and the hallmark starts to become improvement. Right. Right, it's exactly. like, and that's great. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a really sustaining, um, um, that's a really this sustaining process too, because technically speaking again, um, seeing yourself move towards a desired goal is the essence of the positive emotion that nourishes us. And I mean that technically. That's dopaminergically mediated incentive reward. And so, you don't have to get to the goal. You have to aspire to the goal and move towards it. And that, then that doesn't even matter if the goal recedes, which it will as you approach it, because mm -hmm. your, you know, your ability to conjure up what constitutes the ideal is going to become more sophisticated as you move towards it. And you might think, well, that's terrible. But it isn't, because it means the game doesn't have to end. <laughs> right? Because if you may, you'd hit the ideal. Yes. Like, oh, well, game over, reset, you know, but no, no, that isn't <laughs> going to be how it works. It's just, it's going to get better and better and better. And it, it's, it's why it's life is the perfect game. I mean, if you have a really good, for those of us who've played video games, you have a really good video game or even a really good book or even a really good movie series or a show. And it comes to the end and you're like, Oh, there's a huge letdown at the termination of this thing that's been incredibly engaging, mm -hmm. especially Even if, if you win. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You win and you yeah. get this moment satisfaction, but it's replaced almost immediately by the disappointment of the cessation of the game and the recognition that you're in a finite game when you really want to be playing the infinite game. And that's what life is, the infinite game of renewal of life. And that's why it's so good. We'll never replace it. It can't get better. And it's hard as hell. <laughs> and it's hard as hell at the same time and that's that's the way we would want it well it seems like that's the way we would want it i mean that's another thing i talk about a little bit in the new book is like well when you look back on your past it's generally having done something difficult that you remember positively i would say yeah so 
So then there's something about you that craves difficulty, optimal difficulty at least. Yeah. Strangely enough. Yeah. Well, Jordan, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to have, a, to have this conversation. And uh, I just encourage everybody to take a look beyond order and in 12 more rules for life. It's phenomenal. And, uh, and just the utmost gratitude for you um, for doing what you do. Thank well, you so much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed our conversation. And I'm, I'm always aware that it's a privilege to be to have access to to public attention in this fashion. And I appreciate not only you, but the attention of all the people who are going to be watching and listening this. Um, I take their all your attention very seriously, dead seriously. So, and I appreciate it constantly, really minute by minute. So, um, so thanks. Yeah. Thank you everybody for tuning in. So much love. 